Hey guys, this is Carlos Villamar from the Villamar firm. Uh, I'm trying to test this uh, Google Hangouts on air webcast. Um, right now I'm casting my screen and I'll be covering an article um, that I lecture on in Finland entitled Lean Intellectual Property Rights, Maximizing IP Portfolios While Minimizing Costs. Uh, this is a test run, so hopefully it'll go okay. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the article and start with the lecture. All the articles are available online. And hopefully you guys will be able to see this okay once the video is done. Uh, basically, my background is electrical engineering. I was an engineer for about 10 years until Hughes Aircraft started laying people off. And that's when I decided to become a patent attorney. Um, this lecture I'm going to keep short because it's a test lecture, but uh, typically the lectures can run anywhere from an hour to multiple hours, depending on how many stories I tell. So moving forward, um, this lecture covers uh, some basic topics about US patent law and also worldwide patent law. Uh, a quick overview of the U.S. system is that we are now a first inventor to file system. That means that you have to race to the patent office to beat another inventor. Uh, we do have a grace period of 12 months once you make a public disclosure, uh, but we do not like to rely on that 12-month period. Uh, the better course of action is to make sure that before you disclose anything that might have business value with respect to innovation and patents, it's better to get a patent application on file first. In the US, the uh, applicant is the inventor, not the company or university. And what that means is that you still have to list the inventors, uh, but you can list the company now as an applicant with the new, with the new laws. And what that means is that uh, companies can have certain rights if they are listed as also an applicant. Uh, right now, the patent office climate is very anti-business method and software patents. Uh, I think this is a, a bad move on the patent office, and it's mostly due to lobbying by large firms uh, and corporations uh, who would like to get rid of the patent system. The patent system right now benefits uh, small inventors, startups, and universities, and the large corporations would have no problem getting rid of the patent system and competing with these entities purely on marketing basis, which they would always win. Uh, some pitfalls that I see uh, with startups and universities is missing the boat on IP protection. Uh, typically, they're in such a rush to get uh, money that they end up disclosing their inventions and losing potential patent rights. Uh, some other scenarios that come up are um, not listing proper inventorship on the filings, and also entering into joint ventures with other entities and not specifying uh, what the patent rights are to any products that get developed because of those joint ventures. Uh, moving along in orders to maximize, and minim maximize IP and minimize cost, uh, you wanna do due diligence. You don't wanna just file anything and everything. It is expensive to protect patents, so therefore you should do some due diligence. Uh, it's, it's often advantageous to split up systems into multiple applications to develop the portfolio quickly. Uh, this also creates what's called a picket fence approach by having lots of patents that have to be knocked out in order for a competitor to take over your field or in order for a large corporation to try to knock you out. Uh, by having a large patent portfolio, you are more likely to get bought by a corporation or keep a corporation away uh, than being knocked out. Uh, as far as minimizing costs, this is uh, really my business model where I teach uh, small inventors, universities, and startups how to prepare patent applications so they minimize attorney time. Uh, the attorney is the most expensive component in the patenting process, and minimizing all attorney time is very beneficial for startups uh, and small inventors and universities. Uh, you want to work with an experienced attorney, and you also want to have, um, you know, access to the patent office. Uh, the Villamar firm is located here in Virginia. We're about 15 minutes away from the PTO. And it's very advantageous to be able to go and talk to an examiner uh, to try to get a case allowed. Intellectual property is really like an umbrella. It covers many things, trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, patents, and licensing. Trade secrets, the best example is the Coca-Cola formula. 
uh, it's been kept secret and had it been patented, it would be disclosed because in order to get a patent, you have to disclose your invention. So had Coca-Cola patented its, tr its um, formula, uh, when that patent eventually expired, that formula would enter the public domain and anybody could make Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola is a good example of a trade secret. Other examples of trade secrets are encrypted processes behind servers uh, that you keep top secret. Um, copyrights are basically protecting the authorship of various works of, uh, of authorship. It could be media, it could be a performance, it could be a book, it could be a software um, script, uh, it could be a software file, it could also be an image file or even a, um, a, a circuit, you know, that, that is being captured. Uh, so copyrights protect copying of the actual thing that you created. Trademarks are the brand. Uh, if you think of Google for search engines, Apple for computing products, uh, that's a trademark, Google and Apple. Patents protect functionality. So patents are important when you're trying to protect uh, a functional invention and you want to protect that functionality, which means it really doesn't matter how the person does it as long as they're performing the functionality that's being claimed by the patent. You can prevent them from, from doing what you've patented. Finally, licensing is, is uh, contracts and things like that in order to get money out of your IP portfolio. Uh, a good practice is to have an IP review process in-house. In this respect, ideas come in um, and there's a review team that's usually made up of business people and engineers. And out of that review team comes a decision to either patent, to publish, or to keep secret. Uh, the reason you patent is because you want to protect the innovation. You don't want anybody else to steal it. You want to be able to stop people from doing what you patented. The reason you might publish is because it's something that you don't want to patent, but at the same time, you don't want other people to get a patent on it. If you publish something, you're creating prior art, which keeps other people from getting a patent. And of course, finally, uh, you might want to keep it as a trade secret. Uh, this is an example. It's a bit technical uh, of an innovation process, for example, at Hughes Aircraft where I was working. Uh, this process includes, uh, in this particular process, we, uh, Hughes Aircraft had a patent on the concept of a software-defined radio. Uh, which is a very technical type of radio that can uh, tune to multiple stations at once. Now, even though they had gotten the patent on it, they really hadn't be, been able to build it yet because the computers at the time were pretty slow and they really didn't have a solution. At the time I was working at Hughes, I was working with neural networks and digital signal processors. And I sketched something like this on a napkin, which was a quad core di digital signal processor that's fully interconnected like a neural network. And on the input, you have a, uh, a sea of field programmable gate arrays. And on the output, you also have a sea of field programmable gate arrays. Uh, gate arrays that are programmable means that you can change the logic on the fly. So with this, with this uh, design, I could design any input um, circuitry, any output circuitry, and then the processors could be configured to be in serial or in parallel. With this uh, architecture, we actually built this board and were able to to, to build the first software-defined radio at Hughes Aircraft. Uh, I used to talk a lot uh, with slides that had a lot of words, and I figured out that putting everything in terms of two-dimensional graphs was extremely helpful. So these are some of the concepts that, are, that I'm going to cover in the lecture, and, and I put them in two-dimensional graphs. This graph covers the concept of when to patent and when to make something a trade secret. And it's a function of ease of reverse engineering. And what that means is how easy it is to figure out. So if something is very, very easy to figure out and has a high business value, then patenting is going to be more important. On the other hand, if something is very difficult to figure out and has a high business value, for example, the Coca-Cola formula, then trade secret is going to be more important. Analogous processes uh, in the computer arts might be an encrypted process behind a server uh, that's very difficult to hack. That's something that you might want to keep as a trade secret. 
Uh, this slide covers ease of patenting versus the complexity of the, of the invention. It's, it, it was counterintuitive to me. But basically, as inventions become uh, very, very complex, although they are very difficult to understand, they are very easy to patent. And the reason for that is that as the complexity of invention goes towards infinity, there's a very, very few people that can actually understand what you're doing. And what that means is there's not a lot of prior art. So that means that even though the invention is very difficult to understand, it's very easy to patent. Now, when you get into a very simple invention that has a high business value and is very easy to figure out, um, then then you want to you want to consider um, you know maybe not patenting it. And, and the reason for that is that you know simple inventions um, can be created by numerous people. So the chances of you coming up with something that somebody else hasn't thought of. Um, is probably very unlikely. And what that means is the simpler inventions are much harder to patent because there's a lot of prior art. Um, level of technology uh, versus patenting. Uh, as something is very low tech but has a high business value, patenting becomes very important. When something is ultra high tech and has a high business value, Patenting is less important because people can't figure it out. You might be able to keep it a secret. Uh, a good example of low-tech, high importance uh, is, for example, uh, hotels in Finland have these key cards, uh, like you see in hotels here. However, when you enter the room, you stick the key card in a slot, and that enables the lights in the room to work. When you pull the key card out, uh, all the lights turn off. Now, this is something that has a high business value because if, if you had a patent on that concept of having a key card that turns all the lights on and off in a room, your hotel would be saving a lot more money relative to other hotels, which means you could license that invention to other hotels or you could uh, keep other hotels from practicing that invention. However, it's very low tech and very, very easy to figure out. Without even taking one of those units apart, I know they're either using a simple switch, a mechanical switch. They're either using light to interrupt the light to turn uh, the switches on and off, or maybe they're even using the magnetic card itself uh, to turn the lights on and off. So there's an example of, of something that has a high business value, is very low tech, and patenting would be very important in the, those sort of situations. Uh, patenting versus product shelf life is also important. Uh, it takes a while to get a patent granted. Uh, uh, depending on the art unit in the United States, you might be waiting a couple of years uh, before the patent, uh, patent office issues any sort of office action. So if you have a product that has a very, very short shelf life, like a, a 99 cent app on the App Store that's only going to be around for a year or so, you would never file for a patent on that because of the fact that you, you know, the shelf life is, is too short. On the other hand, things that have long shelf lives, uh, keeping in mind that patents are, the term for a patent is 20 years from the filing date. You know, that's an infinity almost in, in electronics and software terms. Um, so if you come up with something that has a very long shelf life, for example, a gaming engine, uh, a new method of, of doing something, a new device that, that's gonna be around for a long time, in that case, uh, patenting is gonna be more important. Uh, in the United States, we have provisional and non-provisional patents. I treat provisional and non-provisional patents exactly the same uh, because they do have to tell somebody how to make and use the invention. However, provisional patents, the way I use them is to capture a development cycle. And this is because a provisional patent gives you a patent pending, but if you don't do anything with that patent, provisional patent in 12 months, it goes away. It, it stays secret during the time it's pending. And if you do nothing with it, it goes away. So basically the way I use provisionals with startups, for example, is we'll file a first provisional when they're at the alpha stage. <clears throat> if six months down the road, uh, they have uh, an improvement, uh, then we might file an updated provisional. And then before the one year is over, we'll file a non-provisional that captures uh, all the provisionals that were filed before. In this way, we're able to capture a whole development cycle uh, for a product. 
the, the advice lately, you know, with patent attorneys is that you have to file early and often. And of course, this helps patent attorneys, but it doesn't really help the startups and small inventors that need the money to do that. And a provisional patent is a good way to capture a development cycle so you can file early and often in, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, good versus bad trademarks. Uh, a good trademark is not descriptive. For example, Apple for phones, Google for search engines. 20 years ago, if I asked you to give me your Apple, you would probably hand me a fruit. Now, if I ask you to give me your Apple, you probably think I'm trying to steal your iPhone. So uh, Apple is a good trademark because Apple and computing products really has no correlation. As something becomes more descriptive, uh, it becomes less valuable as a trademark. A good example, I saw um, a van on the road that had wedeliverflowers.com, and the name of the company was We Deliver Flowers. Now, this is something you can't trademark because it's descriptive, and it would take that sentence out of the English language. Uh, once you trademark something, you can prevent others from using the trademark. So if you, if you uh, were able to trademark, you know, we deliver flowers, if somebody said we deliver flowers, they would be violating your trademark. So non-descriptive trademarks are better than descriptive trademarks. Ownership of patents, uh, the more work-related something is, the more likely uh, the employer will own it. Uh, the less uh, work-related it is, the less likely the employee will own it. So that's important if you're developing an invention while you're working for somebody, you want to make sure that it's not related to your work uh, and that you do it on your own time. Uh, this next slide basically covers uh, employer versus third-party ownership. If you're a startup and you hire somebody to code some software for you, uh, who owns the invention? If it's related directly related to the contract, then it's more likely that the employer will own it. If it's not related to the contract, then it's more likely the third party will own it. A good example is a game engine. In a game engine that's developed for a specific game, uh, you might want to license the content of the game, the, the characters, the animations, the code, etc., for that specific game. However, you might want to keep the game engine uh, patent for yourself so that you can develop other IP based on that game engine. So there's an example where you want to, might want to parse out who owns what uh, in a third party situation. The ultimate IP ownership problem is who owns IP in outer space. Uh, we're not going to cover this. This was part of a lecture I gave in Finland, and, and it was sort of a case study where I had the kids um, go through and determine, um, you know, what kind of issues you would run into when you have IP ownership in space. You have multiple countries, multiple inventors, and you're in outer space, so you're not in a given geographical area. So who's going to own what? You know, the country, the, the companies, the people, a very complex problem. Uh, you know, uh, patent applications do not have to be searched under the United States uh, patent law. However, there, there may be reasons to search uh, a case to make sure you're not wasting your money or to make sure that your investors uh, get a warm and fuzzy feeling. But uh, searching is really a function of search cost. Uh, as search cost goes to infinity, you're not going to do a search. And the reason for that is, is if you can file a patent application for X amount of dollars, why would you spend a thousand X in order to search it when the patent office is going to search it anyways? So typically with searches, what I like to do is give clients a warm and fuzzy feeling. What we do is we spend maybe a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars on a search. And what we're looking for is to see if something knocks out the idea. If the search report comes back positive and doesn't knock out the idea, then we can say that we have a warm and fuzzy feeling in order to proceed further. The only way you would ever get a guarantee is by spending, you know, many, many thousands worth of dollars. And, and of course, after a certain point, you might as well just file the case and see whether it sticks than spending 10 times that amount uh, in searching. Uh, to search or not to search, uh, typically it's a function of the expertise in the field. If I'm working with a, a rocket scientist, uh, one of 10 people on Earth, I'm not going to tell him to do a search because he knows what he's doing and he knows what everybody else is doing. 
However, as you get into non-experts, searches become more important. So for example, uh, I had two German dogs and my wife had two German cats before we got married. And I knew that it would never work out unless the pets got along. I, I took my dogs to her apartment and they behaved perfectly. I think they knew what was at stake. Anyways, uh, you know, later on we ended up moving together and uh, soon she was pregnant. And I had to clean the kitty litter box because apparently the cat feces is bad for uh, pregnant mothers, you know, for the baby. So there I was cleaning the turds. And this is how inventions are born. An invention is a novel solution to a problem. You're solving a problem and you're doing it in a way that nobody else has done before. So there I was, uh, you know, wrestling the turds. And I said, there's got to be a better way. And I realized it, that if I had a sifter, a box that was like a sifter, that I could just sift the, the, the litter box and, and, and the turds would stay in the, in the sifter and, and the clean litter would fall underneath. Now, knowing what I know that there was probably thousands of frustrated husbands uh, coming up with similar ideas, I knew that I had to search it. And when I searched it, sure enough, there was thousands and thousands of inventions related to kitty litter boxes. Uh, there was one invention that I actually purchased that had an a, a infrared receiver that would know when the cat got in the box. Once the cat left the box, it would have a little scraping arm that run across and put it into a, a bag. However, the gears would jam and, and the thing didn't work and I sent it back. And, and that's where I, I came up with my idea of having just sort of a simple sifter box. Well, sure enough, I searched it and realized that it wasn't worth trying to patent because there was too many frustrated husbands out there. And a week later, I'm at PetSmart and there is the invention, $20 patent pending. And it's stupidly simple. It's three boxes. Two of the boxes are regular litter boxes. The third box is a litter box that has holes in the bottom. You pour the litter on top, they're all stacked together. And when you're ready to clean it, you just uh, shake the, the top box and all the clean litter falls into one of the empty boxes. You dump out the turds and you stick the clean screen on top of the other empty box. And then you dump the clean litter on top and you stick that empty box underneath. No, no moving parts, uh, three plastic boxes. You could actually make one yourself by just buying three regular stackable litter boxes and, and having the third one uh, have holes drilled in the bottom of it. So that was an invention that had a high business value uh, and was easy to, to, to make, but I, I decided to search it because I knew that there was probably a patent on it already. Uh, you know, the, the, the bad news, well, the good news is that you need a patent and the bad news is that you need hundreds of patents. So a lot of companies I work with, you know, startups will say, hey, I've got my patent. And I say, well, I hate to give you the bad news, but you need a thousand patents. And that's because uh, the larger the portfolio size on a, on a technology, the harder it is for a competitor to come into your marketplace also, the more likely you are to be bought rather than to be attacked. So portfolio size is, a, is, a, is, you know, as the portfolio size increases, the valuation of a company will increase, assuming they have technology that's patentable. And this is where my business model helps because, you know, I teach people how to fish rather than sell them the fish. So I teach people how to write patent applications, how to prosecute patent applications, and I charge them for my time. And what that does is it allows them to learn what I know so that that way the process can become more and more efficient and they can start filing patents and develop uh, a large portfolio. Uh, th this is a technical slide and it covers the concept of, of, of an application having many components. This application is a server, a client, a server client and a communications uh, components. And, and we're assuming that there's novelty in all these things. There's a new type of server, a new type of client, and a new type of communication system. Now, uh, startups would probably file this as a single application. And maybe we go after the system first, and then after the server, and then after the client, and after the communications components in a serial fashion. And we can also later on file for other versions of the system, the server, et cetera and develop the portfolio that way. This is the way we work with startups because they don't have uh, unlimited patent budgets. More sophisticated companies will take a complex system like this 
and they will actually break it up into multiple applications, maybe a system application, an application regarding the communication components, an application regarding the client and, and the server, and they may file the system, the server, the client, the communications all at the same time in 100 countries in 100 different ways. And this is how these portfolios can become very, very expensive. Uh, this is an example of the picket fence approach that I mentioned earlier. If you have a patent that, that has a broad claim that captures a lot of infringers, it's great. But the problem is once this, once this patent uh, gets knocked out, uh, you're out of luck. So the approach that I've taken with startups is to, to get lots of patents covering the same breadth of claims but with lots of different patents. And what this does is it makes it very difficult for a competitor to come into your playground. Uh, and also it makes it difficult for somebody to knock you out. And it also makes you uh, a target for somebody that wants to acquire you, you know, like a Google or something like that. Uh, everything I teach is from real world. None of this is from a textbook. So every, all the examples that I give are from real world examples that, it, that, that have worked. And these things do work. Uh, this is sort of, uh, uh, this is a sheet of the, the, the patenting timeline. You know, you have an idea, uh, you decide whether to file it as a provisional or a non-provisional. Within 12 months, you have to either file it uh, worldwide or just in the US. And then at month 30, if you decide to go through this worldwide PCT filing, at month 30, you have to enter the national stages in the various countries. And remember I mentioned that one patent application can generate many, many patents, a portfolio of patents. And when you multiply that times the number of countries, you can see how these portfolios get into the hundreds of millions of dollars very, very quickly. Uh, a rough number is that you want to plan on thirty to $50,000 per patent per country over the life of the patent, which is 20 years. And remember, you might want 100 patents covering a given technology. So you can see how that number uh, increases very, very quickly. And of course, my model is to try to teach startups how to make this process as efficient as possible so that we can get this number, this 30 to 50K over the life of the patent to be a minimal number. And that's what I do. Uh, some of the things to minimize IP costs is you want to use uh, patent application and templates, which I provide. Uh, you want to have a patent attorney that, that is experienced and, and can help you with the learning process. You want to develop an in-house patent capability in order to uh, make the process more efficient. And a good example is I had a startup. Uh, the kid was from MIT. He was on his third startup. And his company was growing about 800% uh, a year. He was hiring about 10 to 20 people, programmers a year. And I said, look, if you really want to be efficient, hire a programmer, but ha have him wear two hats. Uh, he'll be a programmer, but he'll also be somebody that I train in patent drafting so that that way when you guys have an invention, you can very quickly prepare an application and get it ready for filing. Well, I trained his in-house guy to the point where he was sending me just about ready to file patent applications. So we're able to take uh, you know, typically patents cost between ten and twenty thousand dollars conventionally. By teaching people what I do, I've taken that 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 range and converted it to three to eight thousand. But the savings even start more because as the per, as the person I train gets better and better, he uses less and less of my time, and eventually it gets down to a, a you know a low level where we're filing patents for this company for around uh, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars, which is bargain basement level. And, and with this, they were able to protect their technology in a very efficient way. And, and because of that, uh, they were able to get bought by a large corporation, which was a good exit strategy for them. And finally, you know, I can work with clients that have more time than money or more money than time. If you don't have time or money, you know, I still have to pay my mortgage. I, I'll try to help you, but I, you know, I'm limited in what I can do because of the fact that, you know, I'm a startup company myself. You know, I run my firm out of, out of my house. And, um, and, you know, I, I need to pay my mortgage as well, but I, I still try to help the community as much as possible. Uh, you want to work with an experienced attorney. Uh, you know, it's important to, to have somebody that, that, that is experienced. Uh, also having an attorney that is near the patent office is highly ad advantageous, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's important to have interview, interview cases, you know, by being close to the, to the patent office, I'm able to go in and talk to examiners and get, get cases allowed very efficiently. 
Uh, these next slides are talk about costs, you know, but the bottom line is it's very expensive to do a worldwide patent portfolio. This is an example of some of the costs in Europe uh, a few years ago. Uh, here's another cost slide. Th this is an example of a case study I did for a client. Uh, th this particular startup client is actually one of my best case scenarios. They filed an IP portfolio in 13 countries and regions, just about every every country and region out there. And what I did is I got a quote uh, from a, a UK firm on what they would have charged for the countries and regions. And they came out to about 100, 113,000. Uh, by myself working with my own agents, I was able to knock that down to about 70,000. Now this is just for the filing. So you got to remember, you know, you're talking 30 to 50,000 on every one of these regions at the end of the day. So that's a really, really, big, big patent portfolio. And typically with startups, uh, I advise them that look before you, you decide to try to protect the world, you might want to consider uh, becoming rich and famous in the United States. And then on your next invention, you might consider trying to protect the world. Uh, the US is 40% of the world market. Uh, so, um, you know, it is it is a good chunk of the market. And if you can capture that large percentage of the world market, then you know you should be okay on your next uh, invention. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a move in Europe for a European patent. Right now, you know, one patent covers the whole United States, and that's why it's such a great deal. You know, you file one patent and you're capturing uh, 50 states, uh, about 40 percent of the world market. Uh, Europe is going to a, a system where you'll be able to file one European patent and it will cover all of Europe. There's some good and bad points to this and, and I won't go into that right now, but we can talk about that offline if you like. Uh, these next slides were very specific to copyright protection for a lecture I gave in Finland, so I'm going to skip these. I covered copyright protection and this, this is an important slide. This is a case study. Um, I, I was a, a Google Docs subscriber and their interface was horrible. In order to upload to the cloud, you would drag and drop a folder and, and it was throttled, which means it would take forever to upload all the files. And then at the end of like a three day you know, upload, it would say one of your files didn't make it, but it wouldn't tell you which file. Uh, this was unworkable. Uh, so I, you know, and again, I knew somebody must have solved the problem. Sure enough, I found this company Sync Docs and they had written a client server that syncs your desktop to the cloud and it solved the problem. It was $9.99 a month. I, I bought a year subscription, I think for 120 bucks or something. And I loved it. It worked perfectly. Well, about uh, six months after into my subscription, uh, I get a message that Google Drive is available and I download it and install it. And it was pretty much identical to SyncDocs. So I get on the SyncDocs forums and I'm like, and every message is, what about Google Drive? What are we gonna do about Google Drive? And their response was, we're gonna have more features than Google. Well, I, I canceled my subscription and I use Google Drive now. And at that time I had a theory that SyncDocs did not have any, any intellectual property. And the reason I had that theory was because on Google Docs I noticed there was powered by Postini, email filtering by a company called Postini. And I asked myself, why does it say powered by Postini, you know, Google Apps powered by Postini, but why doesn't it say Google Drive powered by SyncDocs? And my theory was that SyncDocs had no IP and that Postini did have intellectual property, but I never tested that theory. Uh, one day a friend of mine uh, that was giving a presentation said, hey, what was that case study? And I told him, and he called me back and he said, you're 100% right. Uh, SyncDocs had no IP. So I updated the slide and now you can see that when I search a patent office, they had no pending or issued patent applications. Uh, by contrast, uh, when I searched uh, Postini, they had one, two, three, four, five, six patents and a bunch of pending applications. In this situation, Google bought Postini. Uh, they, my understanding is they bought all the IP, all the people, and my understanding is the head of the CEO of Pistini is now in charge of email filtering at Google. So again, you know, these are lessons that, that are that come from the real world and not make believe.
and that's what I try to teach people. Uh, you know, right now there's a movement to get rid of patents. I think it's a very bad move. It's mostly pushed by the larger corporations uh, that are more than happy uh, to compete with you on marketing instead of on IP. So if people are telling you that patents are bad, you should get rid of patents. It's really going to favor only the large corporations and not the small inventors, startups, and universities. Uh, that's the end of this presentation. I do want to talk a little bit about a startup idea that I want to present and that I'll be presenting in Finland. In fact, uh, this may be Finland may be the first place where this this idea uh, gets formulated. The concept I call it OU812. It's named after the Van Halen album, as you probably guys already know. Uh, no, no reason. I just like OU812, so I I, I called it that. And it's basically, uh, it's going to be a finished startup that is taking teams of startups and universities that are going to work as a team together in order to compete with the large corporations. Uh, it's basically the concept of digital unions. And I'm not going to go into it into a lot of detail, but there is a link uh, on my website to this OU812. And really, you know, this is the big picture right here. Basically, the concept is that we're going to have open innovation uh, within uh, this environment. And even within that environment, you're going to have uh, subgroups like sensors, apps, software, health apps, you know, different gaming. And, and there's, there's sharing of IP amongst the subgroups and the groups. And all the IP, the patents, go back into the portfolio. And then these portfolios can be licensed to corporations along with the products related to the portfolio. This is very advantageous to corporations to buy uh, port patent portfolios along with the products. And these, these portfolios can be auctioned off or they can be licensed to individual companies. And, and it could be a very great revenue stream for these organizations. The other advantage of the system is that it creates a uh, product development tiger team. So for example, if I have the best sensor designers in Finland over here, uh, a company like Nokia can say, hey, I need a sensor that does this, this, and that. We can develop the sensor, uh, get all the IP protected, and then turn around and license that portfolio to the company in a nice little package. Uh, I'll be working with some, some um, people in Finland this next trip in November to see if we can implement this uh, at an incubator level. Uh, uh, Turku Science Park is one of the places I'm looking at, or also perhaps even at the Finnish government level. Uh, this is really how startup small inventors and universities will be able to survive in the future because the patent laws have made it so expensive for individual startups to compete uh, that they're basically going to be wiped out. That is the end of the lecture. Uh, you know, this thing can be extended a lot longer. I'm trying to keep it as short as possible. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always find me on my website. Uh, think of a villa on Mars, villamars.com. Um, and I don't know if you can't see the top right there, but it's uh, V-I-L-L-A-M-A-R-S.com. I couldn't get villamar.com because it's a resort in Mexico. So I, I was able to get villamars.com, plural. And uh, it gave me the perfect mnemonic device. Think of a villa on Mars and you will be able to locate me anytime. And with that, I will stop the broadcast, and I thank you for whoever will be listening. Thank you very much.